Greetings, friends and fellow freelancers. Welcome back to another episode of Tabletop Mercenary. This week, I want to talk about a particular design bug that has gotten into my bonnet recently, particularly because I'm working on a lot of supplements for my own RPG, Army Men, a game of tactical plastic. And while this is particularly prevalent around games that have lots of military hardware or lots of hardware in general, it's not solely restricted to those. So I wanted to talk about it this week, and for those who didn't read the title, we're talking about design bloat or design creep. If you are not familiar with the phrase, uh, you've probably played games that have it, even if you didn't know this is what it was called. Uh, for instance, think back to the glory days of Dungeons & Dragons 3.5, or the days of D20 Modern, which was a smaller time period of that section that I'm talking about. But particularly with D20 Modern. It makes a better example, so I'll go with that one. If you read through the books, you will find there are exhaustive lists of practically every real-world firearm you could ever want to bring in this game, from every major manufacturer, from most armies in the world, explicitly the American army. And there's a lot of stuff. Whether you wanted to play a character who was fighting during the Cold War in Russia, or whether you wanted to play somebody who was deployed in Vietnam in the 60s, or you wanted to play somebody who, at least at the time the book was released, was using modern, we'll say, uh, reality-accurate equipment, you had all of it there, on the page, ready to be used. The difficulty you ran into was, after a while, it didn't matter whether you were playing someone who had a Ruger, a Heckler & Koch, a Smith & Wesson, if they were using a state armory weapon. All of them had roughly the same stats, no matter what you were using. If you had a shotgun, it was the same shotgun no matter what country produced it. If you had a heavy semi-automatic pistol, if you had an assault rifle, if you had a machine gun, almost... None of them had any real mechanical differences. There were maybe half a dozen different types in the whole game that had a different ammo capacity here, a different range there, a different loading trick here or there you could build a character around, but most of them were just a new name with the exact same capacity, the exact same range, the exact same damage. Nothing had meaningfully changed, but they printed all of them. And that was frustrating when I got them the PDFs for free. If I had paid actual money for the books, that would have been infuriating that I had dropped 30 to 50 bucks on a hardback book that had just essentially given me the same stats copied and pasted dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And that is probably the most egregious example of design bloat I can think of. It is when you take a game and your desire to present mechanics or to present options exceeds your ability to actually make them mechanically different or to make them mechanically special. And I am not saying by any stretch of the imagination that designers should have gone back and tinkered with them until they had hundreds if not thousands of mechanically different weapons that would have been equally exhaustive in a completely different direction. And I bring this up as a contrast for folks who have not picked up my own game, Army Men, yet. When I sat down to design weapons for this setting, and I wanted to put together a bunch of different guns and grenades and melee weapons all throughout the different armies that show up in the setting, I wanted them to be mechanically different. I wanted them each to be special and to offer their own options. At the same time, I did not want any of them to be an objectively better choice. And this is something that you can also run into when it comes to design bloat of. I mentioned D&D 3.5 earlier. This happened a lot, particularly with prestige classes, and then later toward the end of the run when subclasses and archetypes became a thing. You ran into classes that had dozens if not hundreds of different options, but really there was only one of them you picked, because one of them was mechanically the best option. And while the others might have had some fun fluff and flavor, there really wasn't a situation where they were going to outshine the one true option, and that is also a problem you run into. As I mentioned with Army Man, uh, consider two very different characters built off the same chassis. Uh, you have the Grunt, which is this game's equivalent of your fighter. If you want to play a Rifleman, there are dozens of different options for you, and each of them are 
mechanically significant, and they offer their own advantages and disadvantages. For instance, there are some rifles produced by Acrylica, which is one of the southern nations of this particular setting. They have very accurate, very long-range rifles that are very good quality. But for that accuracy, you give up a little bit of range, you give up a little bit of ammunition capacity. At the same time, you have uh, the equivalent of the Garand. I do not recall what I named it at the moment, I don't have the book in front of me. But this rifle offers you less range than some of the others, but it offers you a lot more punching power. At the same time, you have a smaller clip capacity. So, you have to sort of weigh that. Are you more of a one-shot, one-kill kind of build? Or are you a character that needs to put as many bullets in the air as possible? These are questions you need to ask yourself, because depending on which options you take, depending on which mechanics you put into your character, one of those rifle choices may be mechanically better for you. More importantly, though, they are actually different and distinct. It's not just the exact same mechanics with two different names. Now, for my fellow designers out there, there is a second part of design bloat that we need to talk about. It's also been called mission creep, which is something I believe Josh Heath told me about. It may have been another designer. Apologies if uh, I got this wrong and someone is wondering why I'm misquoting the conversation. For those who have not heard the term, uh, mission creep, as I understand it, is a term used in various military circles, and it is when your mission starts expanding to the point where it starts growing out of control. Uh, for an example, let's say that you and your squad were tasked with securing a building. That is your goal. Get to that building, secure that building. On your way there, you start noticing there are maybe people who are in danger. You start hearing reports of gunfire in other unrelated places. You start coming across these various, for lack of a better term, side quest options. Things that are outside of the mission you were given and outside of the terms you were told you had to achieve. Yes, you can start doing those things, but you are deviating from the mission parameters you had. You are expanding it. And perhaps your logic is like, well, these people are from the building we're going to, so we are going to escort them there. And it is theoretically part of our mission to help cover that. If you start asking yourself, well, why are we getting involved in this other firefight over here? It's like, well, it's close to our destination. So theoretically, by getting involved in this, we are in a roundabout way, helping secure the original building we were told to. You can explain it away, you can come up with reasons that these choices still fit the mission you set out for yourself, but you are going to end up making a lot more work and a lot more danger, even if we're not actually uh, using guns instead of, so instead of pens. But this is the sort of thing that lots of designers will have, and again, I almost had this with Army Men as a game. When I was designing it, my primary focus was to design an RPG that had a toy military theme. That was what I wanted. I had the main antagonists, I had the main protagonists, I had a setting firmly in mind, and I wanted it to focus mainly on a squad of characters, which adapted very well to a party dynamic, and I wanted it to mostly focus on infantry, at least to start with. There was going to be a lot of characters on foot, a lot of characters doing things in small groups, either infiltration or fighting smaller groups of enemies or doing scouting missions, things like that. And as I started designing the game, as I started creating more mechanical options, as I started comparing it to both real world militaries and to the army men toys that we all know and love and then inspired the game in the first place, there were a lot of other considerations that started coming up of. Vehicles is probably the biggest one, and this is where I actually drew the line of lots of people were telling me I needed to include a vehicle section in the base book. And I agreed, if I put vehicles in there, people would want them, people would use them, but then the question becomes, where does that stop? Do I just give jeeps and trucks and motorcycles? Do I give air transport? Do I focus on combat air vehicles? Do I focus on ships? Do I do an entire category of ships? Do I focus on weapons mounted on vehicles? Do I then need to have vehicular combat sections? And technically all of that is well within the realm of the game, but if I had chosen to include all of that, 
where would it have been enough? Where would that rock need to stop rolling before it was okay to include at that point? And what I decided looking at it and weighing all of those options is that I had already put in several years of work. I had already done all of these other sections. The game did not require vehicle combat and vehicle rules to work. They would have been a lovely addition. There are a lot of people who wondered about them, but it wasn't a necessity of gameplay. So I basically took all the ideas that I'd had and I set them aside and I said, that is outside the scope of this mission. If this book is successful, if it's proven there are players and those players have interest and they want further expansions of the game, then we'll do one that's Army Men Motor Pool. We will do those vehicle rules, we will do land, sea, and air, and maybe we'll introduce additional mechanics for them. You'll get new weapons for things that you can put on on vehicles, you'll get ship-to-ship -ship combat, you'll get aerial combat, you'll get you know, vehicular combat if you want to run somebody over with a jeep, if you want to hit a Vespoid with a truck, and probably some new character classes, some new subclasses for things like you know, transportation drivers or people who specialize as you know, aerial gunners, uh, ace pilots, things like that. But again, that was far outside of the initial role of what I was trying for, and that was far outside the original mission. Could I have put it in there? As I said before, I could have. But it would have added so much time, so much energy, so much word count, that we would have needed so many more resources to make that happen, it would have significantly lowered our ability to deliver a quality product. And those are, to sum up, the two things you need to ask yourself when we're discussing bloat in game design of when you are designing parts of your game. First, ask yourself, is this meaningfully, mechanically different from other options? If you're just renaming the exact same shotgun mechanics 12 times, you don't need to do that. Just put it in there one time and let people reskin it how they want, whether they want to be using a Benelli or they want to be using a trench gun. If the mechanics aren't going to change, they can say it looks like whatever they want. Alternatively, if the things you're designing will add to the game, if they are meaningfully, mechanically different, how far outside of your current goal, your current book, your current word count, whatever you want to use as your metric, how much is it going to add? Where are you drawing that line? Because in a lot of ways, it's sort of like writing a novel series of, this is all technically part of the same story. But you need to figure out where one story ends and the next one begins, because if you try to jam it all into one book, it's going to be unpublishable and possibly unreadable. You need to make sure that you're giving people enough that they can use, but not so much that it overwhelms them, because if they want more, they will tell you. And it's entirely possible that even if you have good ideas, if you have fun supplements, if you have extra stuff you want to make for the game, it's possible that there's not enough interest to justify that energy being put into another product. And that is an unfortunate thing we need to be ready for as designers and as creators of a lot of the time the audience might not be there for a thing we want to make. And we need to kind of make peace with that before we get started. Otherwise, we're just going to be working on labors of love that no one's really interested in. And if we were just making games just to make games, if we were making things just for ourselves or just for our friend group, that would be fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But as the name of the channel implies, I'm assuming folks are coming here to learn how to make money as RPG designers. And just because you have a good idea or just because you believe in something, that doesn't mean it has an audience. So don't let your mission parameters get too big and don't waste your reader's time. These are the two main takeaways of today's lesson. And uh, this is our 10th episode, which I'm pretty excited about. This is usually around the time where I decide a show has enough legs to keep walking. There's enough people watching, listening, reading, etc. that it's worth keeping going. So, uh, yeah, wish us luck in the comments below. Or if you have a question that you would like answered in a future episode or something that I haven't covered, or maybe you have an example from your own uh, gaming and creation career of design bloat that you think would work as a really great example for folks who still may not be getting it. Put that in the comments. Uh, I don't think you can put links on YouTube anymore, but if you uh, can provide a reference, please do so. I want to look at them uh, and I'm sure other folks will as well. And uh, 
As always, the support links to our shiny new Patreon and Kofi are in the description below. And I'll see you next time. Till then, this is your Tabletop Mercenary, signing off. First and foremost, thank you for staying to the end of this episode of Tabletop Mercenary. If there's a question you have about being an RPG creator, please don't hesitate to put it in the comments below so I can address it in a future episode. If you want to help me keep the lights on and keep this show going, then please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, and giving it a share on your own social media pages to help boost the signal. Lastly, if you really enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a tip by buying me a Kofi or becoming a Patreon patron at the links in the video description below. You'll find me on both sites under the name The Literary Mercenary.